Thank you and good morning to Roebuck Presbyterian Church. We're sorry for everybody online who was waiting on the live stream. We were having a uh, time getting it open, but it is here and we're glad you are with us. Hope you had a very Merry Christmas uh, this past weekend and that it was well spent with your family or uh, socially distanced or however you may have done it. We're glad that those who are here are here to worship the one true and living God. There are a few announcements here today. Tonight at 6 p.m., uh, I'll be back preaching uh, tonight from Psalm 51 on a psalm of repentance, and we hope that you will be there for that. Uh, one uh, announcement, or two announcements, rather, that are not included here. Uh, Pastor Richard wanted us to know, wanted you all to know that uh, this upcoming Wednesday, so January the 6th, we will restart our Wednesday night Bible study. Uh, that will uh, com commence again online through Facebook, and there will be a Zoom link sent out as well uh, for prayer following. And then also, if you are a young adult, I would love for you to be here next Sunday at 9 o'clock for our young adults group. It had been approved by the session uh, some time ago, and uh, it was uh, Richard was telling me that it, it's at this point wherever uh, I wanted to start it that we could do it. And uh, for a variety of reasons, I uh, wasn't able to do it until until next week. And so next week, next Sunday at nine o'clock, we'll be here, and I'll have breakfast and such for you for those who make it out. And then also, if you noticed, last month we had a. Uh, our offering uh, $16,157 and that if you want to continue to uh, send in your tithes and offerings there will be the offering out back or you can mail it at the address P.O. Box 284 Roebuck, South Carolina 29367 and then of course we will continue our worship online for the forthcoming future at 10 o'clock and 6 p.m. online. So now let's turn to the front of our bulletins for our call to worship. This is from Jeremiah chapter 31, verses 7 to 9. So hear now God's call to worship. This is what the Lord says. Sing with joy for Jacob. Shout for the foremost of the nations. Make your praises heard and say, Lord, save your people, the remnant of Israel. See, I will bring them from the land of the north and gather them from the ends of the earth. Among them will be the blind and the lame, expectant mothers and women in labor. A great throng will return. They will come with weeping. They will pray as I bring them back. I will lead them beside streams of water on a level path where they will not stumble because I am Israel's father and Ephraim is my firstborn son. This is God's call to worship. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, we thank you for this day. We thank you for bringing us into your house to worship you as you have commanded us to do in your holy word. We thank you for the time that we had with our families, uh, however great or small they may have been, as we commemorated the birth of your son, Jesus Christ. I pray, O oh Lord, that you will now bless our time of worship. You will bless the preaching of the word that will be effectual to those who hear and that it will be effectual to the one who uh, preaches it. I pray that you will glorify yourself even now as we enjoy, uh, partake of this time of worship today. We ask this in your son's name and by the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. <laughs>
turn with us to the Gospel of Matthew, the 28th chapter. Um, this is one of the, uh, this is the first Gospel listed in your uh, Bibles and your New Testament scriptures, and it's one of my favorite ones. I remember hearing it preached very often uh, in my Baptist church growing up. Uh, it was one of those things that uh, one of the things I appreciate most about our Southern Baptist brethren is their uh, commitment to world missions, and they do it uh, very well, I think, and they preach this passage a lot. It's their, their cornerstone in many ways, uh, and it should be ours as well. This comes at the end of the gospel. Uh, this is the whole theme of the gospel is really the coming of the kingdom, the coming of the kingdom of Christ and him establishing his messiahship for his people and he is coming to lead them uh, in ways that are that the kingdom of God has not been done before at least the authority of the kingdom has not been mediated before now and Christ's final marching orders is for them to go out and preach the gospel his apostles really throughout the entire nation and he sends that out to them on the basis of his authority and he gives them that hope of promise and assurance in verse 20, he says, And lo, I'll be with you always, reminding them of the presence of the church of God on earth until he comes again. And so those are our three main identifiable points that we see in the text. And so we know, therefore, that this is a, we can see that uh, the church's mission is spiritual. It's not temporal. We are in the business of preaching the gospel to lost sinners that they may repent and believe the gospel, and so that will be demonstrated thus. So now we'll read our passage from Matthew 28, beginning in verse 18, and we'll read to the end of the chapter. <clears throat> Hear now the word of our living God. And Jesus came and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Amen. This is God's word, and let us now pray for his blessing. Dear Father, I thank you again for this day to worship and hear the preaching of your word. I pray that you will bless it, that you will make it effectual to all who are hearing it and who are the one who is preaching it, Lord. I pray that it will be, uh, that you will communicate the truth to our hearts so that we may be different, better off, really, having come and heard your word than when, before we came in. I ask this in your son's name and through the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. I don't know how many of you have ever thought of your final words of what you would say to a loved one, particularly if they were going to, you were leaving them from, say, a Thanksgiving celebration or a Christmas celebration, you would probably say something along the lines of, I love you, or you would probably say something, I miss you, or you might say, do, or as I've said, don't do anything I wouldn't do myself, uh, or maybe some combination of the three. Uh, you would certainly want to give your uh, family members or friends some well wishes and some positive memory, so to speak, as they go out and do what it is that they know that they're going to do when they leave. Well, in the same vein, you see Christ doing the same thing. He's giving his apostles their, their final commission, their final marching orders as far as how the kingdom of God is going to expand and go forward from here on out. If you remember reading in Acts chapter 1, in that passage, uh, after Christ has called the apostles to the mountain where he ascends up into heaven, he reminds them of the kingdom of God that is about to come, it's about to go forward. And, and the apostles' natural reaction to that is, well, are you going to establish the kingdom of Israel now? And of course, by verses 6, 7, and 8, he says, Christ does, uh, no, this is not for you to know. Uh, the Father will establish it, establish it in his good time. And that would be a natural question to ask in, after we see here where he says all authority has been given unto him. He gives them the commission and then promises that he will be with them. You would expect 
that sort of question to come up. Well, are you going to now establish the kingdom? And indeed, the Great Commission is just for that purpose, to establish the kingdom of God on earth in this through his church. And he establishes the church by means of his own authority. He says again in verse 18, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. The natural question that you might would be asking in light of that passage is, well, what sort of authority is being communicated here? Is this the sort of authority that uh, he didn't have before? Is this a new authority that Christ has that um, he didn't share with the Father beforehand? And of course, that's a natural question, but I don't think it is, is quite understanding the authority in, that, in the appropriate way in which it is. Of course, God, or Christ, is the second person of the Trinity. He's co-equal and co-substantial, and he is uh, pre-existing with the Father in eternity past. And so, as far as his authority goes over all of creation, it's already there. He was there at the beginning when God spoke the world into being. So it's not that he never had authority, so to speak, before. Rather, what he's communicating is, is that the authority that he now has, or that the authority the Father has, is being mediated through Christ in a new way. It's really a new order of things that are being done. By virtue of Christ's obedience on, in this life, and his going to the cross, dying on it, rising again, and ascending into heaven on high, he is really establishing the fact that he has given Satan a decisive blow, the, the dominion, the power, and principalities that Satan had exercised in our world before is certainly not how it is now. Uh, as Christ's kingdom goes forward, it expands through the preaching of the gospel, people's hearts and minds will be illuminated to gospel truth. And Satan has no power anymore, so to speak, to keep people blinded from that fact. And so it's a newly mediated authority in that way. And you see that his authority extends over heaven and on earth. I just mentioned a moment ago that it's an authority that he had before, but certainly it's newly mediated. You would probably think of it more in terms of, though it's not a perfect analogy, it certainly will work for our purposes here. It's something like uh, a new president coming in. You have one president of a different administration. He's on his outgoing and you have a new president with a, in a new entirely different party with an entirely different mission for the country. It's not that the authority has changed so much, but rather the administration of that authority has changed. It's a new way. There's bringing in new changes and all of those things that are accompanied with it. And so we see, as far as Christ's kingdom extending to the whole earth, it's certainly different in that way. And certainly we know that Satan prowls around seeking whom he may devour on the earth. And you would think that as he goes around, he's still seeking those whom he may deceive. And, and certainly he does do that in, in times and places. But the fact of the matter is that by Christ's authority in which he sends people out, Satan cannot keep those whom God has called and appointed unto eternal life from believing. And it's based on that authority that he sends them out in verse 19. This is really the Great Commission itself where he says, Go and make disciples, baptizing and teaching. Now I know that Pastor Richard is a very careful teacher, and I'm sure that he has talked about this passage before. But if, in case he hasn't, I'll point out right quick that in this passage, there's only one notable imperative, that is the imperative to make disciples. And so as you see the rest of it go, the, the issue to command is sort of imperatival in its sense. It it's the, the, has the force of a command, but it's not a command itself. We do this in English all the time. You'll say, uh, I'm going out to do this, or I'm going out to do that. And the idea being here in the language is that it's as you're going or having gone out. In other words, what Christ is communicating to the apostles is that as you go, whenever you go, wherever you go, and as you're always going, you are to make disciples. And make disciples of whom? All the nations. Now, there's something that I want to abbreviate or uh, make an amendment to right quick. And I said earlier that the... Gospel of Matthew, the whole theme is establishing Christ's messiahship, his, his kingdom, the kingdom of God is at hand, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. He uses that language writ large. And, and most scholars would agree that the Gospel of Matthew itself is written primarily to a Jewish audience. 
He's trying to establish his messiahship. He's the anointed one of the king as the king of the Jews. And so the gospel, is, the gospel of Matthew itself is geared towards that way. And so it's pretty interesting here that he would say to make disciples of all the nations. Indeed, I would say that it's been the whole purpose of redemptive history, the whole from Old to New Testament, that God is seeking to save all the nations anyway. You see that throughout the whole Gospel of Isaiah. I'm not going to read them, but I'll just make a brief mention of them. But that they're in Isaiah 42, verse 6, Isaiah 49, verse 6, Isaiah 52, verse 10, Isaiah 60, verse 3. And so if you wanted to go look up those later, you certainly could. The, the whole purpose of God's commission throughout the entire Bible is to bring people of all nations, languages, and tongues to himself. And this is exactly in keeping with the promise that he made to Abraham in Genesis chapter 12, that it is through you, it's through your seed that you will be a blessing to all the nations. In fact, the seed being Christ is the one whom when we are gathered into and united to by faith, by the working of the Holy Spirit, we're united to Christ by faith, we are therefore part of Abraham's seed and therefore partakers of the benefits of the covenant that he made with Abraham so long ago. But there is also a clear uh, way of making disciples, things that characterize discipleship making, namely baptism, as we find it here, and teaching. The Westminster Confession of Faith in chapter 25, verse paragraph 3, I almost said verse, paragraph 3, uh, says that the whole purpose of the mission of the church is for the, or at least in it, as far as its ministry is concerned, is to, for the gathering and perfecting of the saints. Now, how are they gathered? Well, first of all, they have to go, the church has to go out and preach the gospel and bring them in. And those who are saved, appointed unto eternal life, will come in. But that's only one aspect of it, perhaps of uh, discipleship making. They're brought in, of course, they're baptized, they're sealed and signified, and by their engrafting into Christ, the Spirit uses baptism to do that, or God commissions baptism to do just that. And also that they will be able to partake the benefits of the covenant and, and their engagement to be the Lord's. And really what baptism is doing, therefore, is marking them off as the Lord's. Their willingness, or rather their uh, obedience of being united to Christ, that's what baptism itself signifies, that work of the Spirit in them. But that's only the beginning, really, of the Christian life. There's also teaching that's associated with discipleship that is used for their uh, benefit. Now, the whole idea, therefore, behind the teaching of the word, therefore, is that they are to be teaching. The natural question would be, well, what are they teaching? Well, he says in verse 20, he says, observe all things that I have commanded you. And the idea, therefore, being that the things that he's commanding the apostles to teach is the whole counsel of God. Uh, in our day right now, we have a, a very... A lot of churches have a very nasty habit, and I think it's a very unfortunate habit of not preaching the whole counsel of God. Uh, there's an attitude that we need to not preach wrath or judgment or hell. You, they would see you something as somewhat out of your mind. You must be kidding. And why would you be preaching those horrible things? Because people don't need that. You've already been beating them down with their sin too much. We need to be talking about grace and love and mercy. And of course, all of those things are important. They, they certainly are. You don't want to devoid gospel preaching of anything uh, less than those things. But the fact of the matter is, is that whenever you're preaching, you're not just preaching grace, love, and mercy, but you also have to preach uh, judgment, wrath, and hell. There is no way in which you have a full gospel without it. Uh, you don't understand, you wouldn't understand the full meaning of the gospel unless you understood the fact that the wrath of God that had been poured out would be poured out on us if we are not found in Christ. The fact of the matter is, if one stands outside of the will of God, if they are not been united to Christ, then they are vessels of wrath, as Paul talks about in Romans chapter 6, that God, he says God does create some for this purpose, but those who are already outside of God's will and not regenerated, they do stand as vessels of judgment. And so those who have been united to Christ know that that wrath has been poured out on him, the wrath that you and I most certainly deserve. 
And that's why the faith in Christ is so much more important. It's more than, so important. It's more than just walking down an aisle, writing a card, or doing anything of that sort. And that's certainly uh, good things to do in their, in their time and place. But the fact of the matter is, just simply praying a prayer and writing a card does not make one a Christian. Making one a Christian is being united to Christ and keeping his commandments, doing the very things that Christ is commissioning them to do. Uh, you keep his commands, you obey his commands, and in fact the church are the ones who are supposed to be teaching these things in their appropriate contexts. And so, so certainly evangelism is accompanied with, therefore, preaching. The commission itself has been given to the church and is to be facilitated by the church leaders. And so you might would under, want to ask the question, therefore, of, well, where is our place in all of this? Well, certainly, uh, members of the church ought to be witnessing the gospel. They ought to be uh, sharing the faith with everybody else. But just know that the fact of the matter is that as far as baptism and teaching goes, that does belong to the church officers. That's what they're ordained and set apart to do. But we all have a part to play as far as going and making disciples in some way or other. Because we have the hope and we have the knowledge that those whom we go preach to and those whom we bring in are the ones whom and who the Spirit works faith into are those whom God has appointed unto eternal life as we see in Acts 13. It's only by the preaching of the word and by the accompanying of it by his spirit that it's made effectual, uh, applicable really for those who will believe. His word and spirit are what he uses to bring those to himself. And this is really a difficult task, particularly in our age where there's a great deal of apathy to our uh, church, to not just our church in particular, but the church writ large and, and Bible teaching. And so the Lord himself knows that it will be an incredibly difficult thing to do. The church throughout all the ages endures a lot of trials and a lot of tribulations, particularly in Africa and in China and increasingly more even in this country. And so you see in verse 20 what he says, And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. I made mention again that it, would, that it would be a very difficult topic. The tribulation certainly accompanies the church in all ages. Some of you may have yourselves at some point or other, when you've witnessed to somebody, you have uh, certainly uh, been on a neg had a negative reception. I know I have in my own time, uh, which is not all that long in terms of years, but certainly in terms of evangelism, uh, I've done it before and have certainly received a negative response. Our brothers throughout church history and certainly uh, in our present day oftentimes lose their very lives for the preaching of the gospel. And so you would almost have the sense of what the saints pray for, pray to Christ for in the book of Revelation. How long, O oh Lord, will these things Continue, And, of course, that's not for us to know. We will know when Christ comes again, when he comes with the trump of the archangel and the, the voice of God breaking forward in the clouds. We will see him as he is, as, he, as the apostle saw him when he ascended in great power and great glory. So it will be no mistake that we know him when he comes. But the fact of the matter is we don't know when that time will be. We... Uh, and so we're to persevere to the end. And Christ says that I will be with you always. In light of the tribulation, we know of the external threats, but we also need to keep in mind the internal threats. The confession again says in paragraph 5, it says, The purest churches under heaven are subject both to mixture and error. And some have so generated as to become no churches of Christ, but this is harsh language, but I think right language, but synagogues of Satan. In other words, there are many churches in the world who will claim the name of Christ, but will certainly be anti-Christian. They will not be preaching a real gospel. They will not be preaching any sort of gospel at all. And the fact of the matter is, people will believe it. And that is what makes the uh, ministry of the church all the more difficult. And you might be wondering exactly well, where biblical churches will be. Well, the fact of the matter is, wherever they are, the, the confession in light of this promise says, Nevertheless, there shall always be a church on earth to worship God according to his will. 
I was listening to a story uh, recently by a theologian named Sinclair Ferguson. He's, uh, he works for, or he at least teaches alongside of Ligonier Ministries in Florida, it's a ministry that R.C. Sproul uh, began so many years ago. And in a Q&A session, he, he made the remark that uh, in terms of his own country, Scotland, they're actually about 20 to 50 years ahead of this country, the United States, in terms of its move towards secularism. Um, the church has certainly lost its influence. The government of Scotland has vowed to be the most progressive, if you will, of any country in the Western world, and certainly that's typical of Western countries writ large. They're not only forgetting the gospel, but they're doing everything that they can to distance themselves from it and purge it from society. And yet, and yet, in spite of that, there are still spiritually vital churches that are preaching the gospel, that are worshiping God. Uh, they're small. You have to know where to look to get to them, he says. But they're there. They're real. They're vital. And that so long as those churches remain, God will bless their ministry. And so it's not a matter of the fact that we see in at least in our country, that the church's influence has certainly waned. It's not a matter of that. But the fact, in spite of that, in spite of the church's ministry waning, or influence waning, um, Christ offers us in this promise very clearly that so long as there is a church to worship, and he will be with them. In the ministry of the word, and in everything that they do, he will be with them. And we need to remember that because of how difficult the days are ahead. He says in John Chapter 16, that yes, you will have tribulations in this world, but I have overcome the world. And so we rest, we hang our hats on that fact because we know exactly how difficult it is. Christ knows how difficult it is, but he gives us this hope of, of assurance that he says, and lo, I am with you always. To how long? To the end of the age. And so what does this therefore mean for us? Well, first of all, we know that the Great Commission gives us the assurance that the gospel will go forward. There's not a power in the world that can stop the gospel from going forward. I may mention earlier about how Christ's authority is being mediated newly in a way that it hadn't been done before. It's a really a new world order. But certainly a new world order, not just in a... a uh, temporal sense or a physical sense, but certainly in a spiritual sense. Uh, indeed, there's not a power, there's no, no evil power in the world, spiritual or otherwise, that can stop the spread of the gospel. I was hearing a story recently that the underground churches in China are, in spite of the persecution going on there, they're growing like wildfire uh, wherever the gospel is being preached because they're being scattered, they're being they're going out further and further, far and wide, to preach the gospel. And so in spite of the Chinese government's efforts to wipe out Christianity, it's doing the church a favor and seeing the gospel spread. And so we know that that is the fact of the matter of this promise, that the church will continue to go forward as far as its mission is concerned. There's nothing, nothing that can stop the gospel from going forward. And so we don't need to fear obstruction. We don't need to fear what any government can do. We don't need to fear what any ecclesiastical body who is the first to the spread of the gospel will do. We rest on the fact that this promise here in light of this commission that Christ will be with us. He's given us his commission to do it and he will enable us and give us his power to certainly do it. But then second, we need to keep in mind that the Great Commission also puts in perspective the church, what the pri church's primary mission is. I, at the beginning of the sermon, I made mention that the church's mission is indeed spiritual. And it is spiritual. The fact of the matter is, at least particularly among young evangelicals, particularly people my age, I don't believe this, but I know a good many do, um, many believe that the church, the American church, has failed in fill in the blank. Uh, they failed in it. Uh, addressing this so social issue or that social issue or this political issue or that political issue. Just you name it, they failed in doing it some way or other. And it really shows how so many misunderstand exactly what the mission of the church 
is. A church's mission is not to correct social and political ends. It really isn't. Uh, certainly, Christians on their own can certainly influence the process, however it might go, but the church as the church is not to be facilitating in that mission. They're not to be engaged in that mission because our mission as a church, particularly as the elders go out and, and preach, they're to be preaching the gospel. Uh, there's never been anybody who's been saved apart from it, and as a world that's got some 7 billion people on it, uh, and it's continuing to grow, you got to think about maybe 4 billion of those have no idea about what the Bible is or the gospel and is and how to believe in Christ. And so the three billion of us that remain who are Christians still need to go out and preach that gospel. And when we're diverted from that mission to any other end, uh, we cease to really be fulfilling the mission that God has called us to do. And that was really the failure of churches, mainline churches, particularly in ages gone by. They forgot that mission. That's why, for example, the PCA, our denomination, was founded because they believed that the mainline church that they came from had forgotten the gospel. Not only forgotten it, but that they have forgotten how to preach it, and they weren't preaching it, and they were obstructing it. That's why they were started, and that's why this church joined them, is because they knew that the gospel was that important to go out and preach. And they were willing to separate and associate with bodies who would go out and preach the gospel. We know that the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ is that those who stand in sin, stand in under God's wrath, and that if we believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, then the wrath that was poured out on him is not going to be poured out on us, and that the righteousness of Christ is imputed to us, but uh, Christ's righteousness is imputed to us and is received by faith alone with the pardon of of all our sins. And that is a great and glorious gospel, isn't it? And that's the gospel that we preach because there's not anything that you and I can do to save ourselves. Not one thing. And the fact of the matter is there are many people who think that they can save themselves through good works. There are a lot of people out there who think that just because that they are good uh, that that's going to make them okay. And the fact of the matter is that's not what the gospel tells us. We're sinners. We need to repent of our sin and believe on the Lord Jesus Christ for what he does. And so that's what we go out and preach. Anywhere you go, wherever you go, you witness the gospel. You witness to people. You live the gospel. You love the gospel. You, your very lives are dedicated to the gospel. And we as a church need to let that be known in this year. We're living in, an, in a year coming up where it's going to be incredibly difficult to live the life that God has called us to live. Uh, in fact, the last year, I know for my own self, it, it was incredibly difficult. But he gives us his word, he gives us his spirit to enable us to do exactly that which he has called us to do. We rest on that. We have a magnificent king and a magnificent savior who gives us this mission, who loves us enough to say, I will be with you, to help you, to encourage you, and if need be, certainly to bring you home. Nothing can separate you from the love of God. And so we go, we preach with fervency and zeal, just as he himself did, as we pray together. Our Father in heaven, we thank you for today. We thank you for the preaching of the word. We thank you for your church. We know, it's, know that you have given us a mission. Often we're not always perfect in keeping it, but we do know, oh Lord, that you give us the power by your word and spirit to go forward and do it. We ask, oh Lord, that as we go from this place, that wherever we go, we might be witnesses to the gospel. May you honor our efforts in that. We pray that you will continue to bless the mission and ministry of this church and that the gospel will never not go uh, forth from the walls of this church. We ask it in the name and for the sake of our Lord Jesus Christ and by the power of your spirit. Amen. You are dismissed. <laughs>